Good afternoon and welcome to today's first energy seminar of 2023 and first of the uh, winter quarter. Thank you all for coming. Uh, before we get started, since this is actually also a class, I'd like to introduce the team that puts the energy seminar together. I'm John Wyant, the faculty director. This is Sarah Weaver uh, from the Precord Institute, who's the uh, seminar coordinator and outreach manager. And this year we have um, Akrudi Gupta as our CA. Akrudi, uh, fortunately for us, uh, took the class about a year ago, about a year ago. So. Uh, if you're wondering, uh, if you're a student and wondering what's going on, we don't have time to go over all that now. Just go log into the Canvas website, and it'll explain it all. And if it doesn't, you can uh, contact uh, uh, Rudy. Uh, so today, I'm uh, very pleased to introduce our, our kickoff speaker, who's a really good one given the uh, state of the world. No, he's not going to talk about flooding, but he will talk about uh, electricity grades, which is probably at least as exciting to uh, most of us. Uh, uh, and his name is Alex Stankovich, and he's a distinguished scientist at SLAC National uh, Accelerator Lab up the hill here, up uh, Sand Hill Road, I guess I would say, the way, at least the way I go uh, up there. Uh, but he's had a very, very distinguished background uh, in the area of electricity networks. He has both a master's and an uh, engineering doctorate from the University of Belgrave, which I think is in Yugoslavia, last time I talked, a PhD, uh, also in electrical engineering from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, has taught at Tufts University, a few other places, is on many advisory boards, and uh, done a lot of industry consulting. So if you look at his topic here, the saga of electric energy networks, um, from Ode to Lament and back, I think I confirmed this in our preamble chit chat, uh, He's going to kind of look back at how we got to where we are today, going way back, which is in itself an interesting story. Uh, but I think the method in that madness for this kind of uh, seminar, and then use that to project forward to see how we could do better than we're currently doing in the future. So to me, he's kind of a, a, a um, example of the old uh, John F. Kennedy uh, dictum. Uh, some people see things as they uh, could be and say why not. So Alex, take it away. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you all for coming to my seminar. Uh, I will, <coughs> uh, uh, I will uh, uh, try to stop roughly along these five uh, stops that you, you, you see. Uh, this is, so I would like to talk first about some issues with current systems. I will propose a decomposition which will help us make some uh, problems uh, quantifiable. Uh, talk about the, the current and, and coming uh, efforts to electrify uh, things that are not electrified, like transport and, and in some industries, and then talk about two personal vignettes uh, that, that uh, work that I participated in. It kind of spans the spectrum from, uh, from very high level, uh, uh, sort of almost policy type work to some uh, fairly technical uh, part of, of uh, system identification. So with that, uh, why do we have this, this dual and sometimes conflicting perception of uh, electric energy systems. Well, as you, uh, there's a little reminder that uh, 20 years back, uh, electrical energy systems were declared to be the greatest engineering achievement of the 20th century, the century that brought us so much exciting stuff. So this is certainly uh, a very strong uh, statement. On the other hand, uh, on the bottom, uh, you see a, a snapshot from roughly four months back uh, after a Hurricane Fiona uh, hit Puerto Rico. And you can see that there's essentially no electricity on the island. So. Uh, so a million and a half customers, you know, four or five million people, completely without electricity. So how come that, that if something is so good, why is it failing uh, in such a major way? Uh, and I would um, uh, like to start with the context. This is a very busy slide, so, so please forgive me for, for too much detail. on it. This is a standard slide on, or sli standard map, if you wish, uh, of uh, energy flows in our society. Uh, uh, Lawrence Livermore Lab has been doing those for 50 plus years. Uh, and this is one, a fairly recent one. Again, very busy, but it does have some key ingredients that I would like to, to point your attention to. So on the left, uh, you see different sources of, of primary energy. Uh, then uh, in the middle, you see some conversion, uh, typically through electrical, as you can see here. And on the right, uh, you, you, you see these, these pink uh, rectangles, which are main users of electricity, residential, commercial, uh, industrial, and so on. Uh, and uh, uh, so there, uh, these... Uh, 
uh, kind of so-called Sankey diagrams, their, their width is corresponding to size. Uh, so you can see that, that the different sources participate differently. You see that the gas is very much there. Uh, you can see that petroleum is even bigger, but on the bottom, the green, you see that it's kind of uh, in doing its own thing. It's mostly connected to, to transportation. Uh, and transportation uh, box on the right is not connected to almost anything else in a substantive way. And there, there, there are cross connections there as well. Uh, the number there on, on top that you see is roughly 100 million qu uh, sorry, uh, uh, 100 quads. So quads are quadrillions. These are 10 to the 15. This is a huge number. Uh, and if you think what it is, so b this is uh, quadrillions of what? Quadrillions of British thermal units. British thermal units are fairly small. British thermal units is what will take probably to heat up this much water for one degree centigrade. Or apparently this was, this was motivated by the size of matchsticks in the 19th century England, so they're probably pretty substantial matchsticks. But so, one, so energy containing one of them is a British ter ter thermal unit, uh, roughly. Uh, but the number, this number, 97 and something times 10 to the 15 is huge. Actually, square root of this number is roughly the population of our country, 300 million, 330 million, right? So that means that per each, each of us, each uh, American, uh, there is a roughly 300 million, uh, give or take, uh, BTUs. Uh, if, you, if you think of how much energy that is, that's roughly 10 kilowatts being run nonstop throughout the year. So that's, that's substantial, right? 10 kilowatts is not a small unit. So for each of us in this room, anywhere else, that's it. So this is a huge, so the overall flows of energy are just huge. Uh, and I know that there are other ways to quantify flows, like exergy, which is very popular locally, uh, and some other ideas. But I will stick to this diagram because of its simplicity. And I will still argue that it gives us some useful numbers. So not, not everything, but there is something useful here. Uh, more important thing, uh, this diagram doesn't change very much. So this is a diagram from 10 years before. It looks almost exactly the same. The total is almost exactly the same. Uh, you see that some things are kind of thicker, especially the, the coal is thicker. I, I will go back and forth. You see the black line is kind of thicker here, right? Uh, and the, the gas is a little thinner 10 years ago, but most other things are, are the way they are. So there is a message there for us that the energy systems change very slowly, the infrastructural systems. And actually, that, that also means that if we want to change w uh, what we see around us today, we have to start today because it will just take a long time for this change to manifest itself. Uh, so uh, if we think why electricity, why should we think about electricity? Why is it an important uh, box there? Well, I would say it has several advantages. It's efficient transport, the utilization, uh, precise control, and it can play nicely with other energy vectors, well, like uh, hydrogen or you know, methane or ammonia. Uh, so these are all very good things. That's the reason why electric uh, energy networks are all around us. <coughs> it's not without problems. Uh, first, production of electricity uh, is, a, is a dicey thing. Uh, the renewables uh, are our are, are preferred solution, but they are highly variable, and we'll talk about this later. How, how can we address that aspect? Uh, storage at scale, I'm thinking about utility size stor storage for, say, three days or more. That is also not, not easy. And uh, uh, maybe the, the problem that is going to cut us more and more is what are the required materials? The materials needed for so some of these changes are either not there or, 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 or they, they happen to be at places uh, that are not easily accessible. Uh, so we will talk about this as well. So, so electricity does have a, a role to play in future energy systems. Uh, but then why networks? Uh, why, why are networks important? Well, uh, I would say that because social, societal uh, expectations of, of electric energy or any energy system, uh, uh, there are many, but uh, among the most important are reliability and resilience. I will talk about each of these in detail, trying to distinguish between them. Uh, but these are also engineered systems, meaning uh, that they have to be considered, they have to be designed for both normal and faulted operation. And often the faulted operation is one uh, that, that, that has more binding constraints than normal operation. Uh, and also, they, they, they are infrastructural systems. They are operational 24-7, 365. So any uh, any time they are not is, 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 is actually uh, a major uh, major uh, down, downside of, of their operation. So uh, I want to show you a, a picture of, of a place where I, where I lived for a long time, for three decades. It's in New England. Uh, so this is a picture from last, uh, uh, last summer. Uh, so just a grab from, from the website of the uh, New England uh, ISO, Independent System Operator. Uh, on the left, you see uh, roughly this diagram with the New England states. You also see prices at different nodes because it turns out the network has some constraints. Those prices are not the same. But if you look at numbers, these, these are prices for megawatt hour. Uh, so this is actually not bad. It's a wholesale price, but it's 12, 12 cents a kilowatt hour. That's, that's pretty good, at least. 
from, from our perspective here. Uh, but you see, that system is actually quite, underlying system is quite complex. And on the right, you see internal presentation of the system. So, uh, so these are different states, the, the major substations, transmission lines, and so on. So, so th there are levels of complexity, if you wish, in the system. Uh, if you look at this a little bit more, it so happens that, uh, that uh, New England uh, uh, dynamical model, so-called New England 39 bus, which is the network that you see on the left, uh, is one of the standard benchmark examples that people who study dynamics of power systems use time and again. Uh, it, it has 10 generators and 39 uh, uh, nodes. Uh, so the, the, the lines are just transmission lines. The, the, the short lines are, are, are buses at major substations. And, and the circles are generators. Uh, and this is a very well-known example. It goes back many years. Again, it's used world over for validating different, especially control ideas. Uh, but you see, each of these circles uh, used to be a, a physical generator, right? a unit that you can walk to. It would pro these are fairly major. Uh, actually, most of them are physical. Number one is not. Number one that you see there on the lower left corner is a representation of New York. Uh, and that, that's actually an important point because uh, all, almost every network that we study is a part of a larger network. So we have to find good ways to represent this outside world so that our conclusions have some, uh, some value to them. But now, uh, these circles are becoming something else. And what you see on the right uh, is what these circles already look at some places or may look very soon. You see many renewable sources, you, you recognize you symbols from, for wind and solar and so on, energy storage, uh, industrial customers who, who are selling and buying electricity. Uh, so these, what, what used to be represented is this example is, a, is just a physical generator. It's actually not. It's something else. And that has important consequences. Uh, I'm showing you, I will show you some dynamical simulations. So on the right, uh, with these nice smooth curves, you see uh, transients that, that occur uh, in, in, in old electromechanical systems with large physical generators, a couple hundred megawatts each, uh, spinning happily. So this is a transient when you have a, a, sh a short circuit and then uh, the system recovers in roughly two seconds. That's not suggested. These are pretty fast systems because this is a, a pretty large area of the country and two seconds is decided with, if it's stable or not. This is so-called transient electromechanical stability. And that's where things are. On the left, uh, you see what's coming. If you replace these generators, these physical uh, electromechanical systems, with uh, uh, these agglomerations of inverter-based generation, like solar, uh, you get transients that you see on the left. They are also stable, right? Uh, but you see these very fast wiggles, uh, which suggest that dynamics is becoming a good deal faster, maybe on an order of magnitude faster. Uh, and also, uh, this, the, the, the transients of, of, of these new sources are largely determined by the settings of controls. In other words, control has much more authority than it used to have in the old electromechanical system, which is both good and bad. Right? It's good because there is a hope of, of us achieving responses that we couldn't uh, achieve before. But it also means that if we set it wrong, that we will get, we will get instability more often. So, uh, so that's, uh, that's uh, coming our way. Uh, challenges in operation are not limited to, to, transi to transients a very short time scale. This is a 24-hour diagram uh, from uh, California Independent System Operator uh, roughly more than a year and a half ago. Uh, and so you, you see the, the, the power in megawatts on, 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 on vertically and hours in the day horizontally. Uh, and there are two diagrams. One is the, uh, the load, the overall load that, that, that uh, in this case, California ISO is overseeing. Uh, and the, uh, the green curve underneath is how much what was the net load, what had to be supplied by the ISO. Uh, and this is known as a duck curve for, for obvious reasons. It looks like a duck. Uh, and you see the, the, the problem is it happens kind of at, at, the, at, the, uh, at uh, say, uh, 5, 6 in, in the afternoon because as the, the solar power goes away, uh, the, the other sources have to pick up. In this case, you see they have to pick up uh, so 10, 15, uh, thousand, uh, 10, 15 gigawatts in the space of hour or two hours. That's tough. Simply, even if you have uh, plenty of, of energy, it's hard to, to fall. And this curve is getting actually steeper and steeper. Uh, so much so that, uh, that you may say, well, will this belly uh, touch zero? And yes, actually, it can go under zero. This last summer, uh, there were times where the, where the net load was negative. What does that mean? That just means that California ISO was exporting power uh, to states that we are connected with. Uh, but there is more to it, actually. The, the system, while you say, oh, this is great, that means that the system as it is today could not be operated on, pure, on, on renewables only uh, for, for reasons of stability. Of course, there, there is lots of effort in that direction. There, there's something called grid-forming inverters, which are better behave inverters uh, from stability standpoint. But this is a challenging problem. So, so in, in a way, uh, we, can, we can supply 120% of our world, but we cannot supply 100. Uh, and th that, so th there, are, there are still technical issues to be resolved. Uh, so, uh, now turning uh, to, on now to defining uh, reliability and resilience a little more precisely, 
Um, you see, the, uh, the advantage of the system solution is that it can achieve reliability that far uh, uh, outperforms uh, reliability of individual components. Uh, and uh, uh, so what kind of reliability numbers we are, we are talking about? Think of a simple experiment. We, we just walk to the system and we see if it's working or not. And we know that. So is it up or is it down? Uh, so then, uh, reliability of three nines, uh, which means that uh, they have 99.9 .9 reliability, means that uh, during a year, which has 8,760 hours, there will be nine hours of downtime. Well, that's a lot. Uh, and you can see now for five, seven, and nine, you see that uh, five corresponds to five minutes a year, uh, seven corresponds to three seconds, and nine nines correspond to only two cycles, two 60 hertz cycles being missed in a year. So these are, of course, extreme numbers. Uh, but it turns out that uh, the, the, these numbers in the middle are kind of what we see at some places. For example, uh, utility systems today uh, are between four and five. Our systems are probably closer to five. Uh, systems in some uh, well-run uh, uh, places like uh, Netherlands or, or, or Belgium achieve close to five. Uh, but that's kind of the, the, these are global numbers. But you see, server farms need seven or eight. So what does it mean? Well, that's obviously very hard to achieve. And, and, and so, but we may think, well, that's not what general utility networks should provide. If they need that reliability, they should kind of do it themselves. And they actually do it. They, they have plenty of backup uh, to achieve those numbers. And just to give you a feel how extraordinary these numbers are, uh, compared with uh, some other events, uh, losing in a roulette, if you, if you take the logger, it's roughly 1.6. So it doesn't look that bad, right? Uh, and uh, being a, a flight without fatality, meaning not that the person will, be, uh, will, uh, will not come alive, but that, that there will be someone on the flight who, who, will, who will be a fatality is 7. Uh, and losing in the Powerball lottery, which I guess now routinely runs into 100 million, is 8. So we are talking of similar numbers. These are very, very rare events, and we would like to, to achieve that level of performance. So that's why it's challenging to operate electric energy networks. Uh, Systems do fail, however. Uh, and this is a picture of a, it's a composite satellite picture of, from roughly 10 years ago, uh, when the, much of the eastern uh, seaboard network went down. Uh, it's a composite, and, and you, can, you can see uh, on the left, you can see places like Detroit, uh, and, and then, uh, then Toronto, Ottawa, Montreal. Uh, on, on the right, uh, Boston and, and, and Long Island and New York on the left. You see, Boston is very, very, very bright there. Uh, and <clears throat> if you were to ask any of engineers uh, in, in my, my for, former place, they would say, yeah, that's because we're excellent engineers, which may be true. But actually, it so happened that that day, New England was exporting power. New England typically exports power for five days in a year. And that was one such day. Uh, so if you, if you have extra power, it's much easier to cut down and to make up for the... Uh, for, for the uh, for the short, short and that's, that's what happened. Uh, you see that the Log Island was still recovering from the event even seven hours after. So these are major events, and these are massive, uh, massive damages incurred by many, many people and, and, and organizations. So systems can fail. So by the way, th this event was initiated uh, by three falling on, 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 on a line near, near Cleveland. Uh, so, so obviously, the very far away places were affected uh, by, by, by an event like that. So. Uh, now, talking about resilience, resilience is a, is a newer term, and, and I, I, so the, the, the big difference in, for the purpose of our discussion is that resilience deals with, uh, with high-impact, kind of low-probability events, uh, think hurricanes, earthquakes, uh, things like that. Uh, and uh, uh, so, again, we would like to limit the extent and, and the system impact, uh, <clears throat> and, and we would like to, co in th this case, we would like to sustain critical services. We know that not everything will be fine, not everyone will be happy, but uh, we, we the effort is just to make it through such event. Uh, and so, uh, I'm just uh, repeating essentially here that operating reliability is the ability to withstand sudden disturbances, but sudden common disturbances, you know, li like unfortunate uh, squirrel jumping on a, on, a, on a transformer and things like that. So. Uh, this, this happens quite regularly, and it was observed many times, and, and utilities have developed practices to deal with such events, typically by having spares, right, having more than one component. So as component is pulled out, the remaining components have enough capacity to pick up the slack, and that's it. Uh, resilience, on the other hand, uh, deals with these low-probability, high-impact events. Uh, this is scenario-based. The analyses are different. Uh, so I think that justifies the requirement that or utilities should consider both of these uh, kind of in parallel. It's a coordinate, of course, because often it's the same equipment that, 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 that addresses both. But 
uh, it has to, uh, these are different because during resilience events, these are different paths, di different operating modalities that are, that are normally not exercised. So if you, uh, so every now and then one should plan for them so when they come around, uh, uh, we are ready. Uh, because this is uh, another picture from Puerto Rico from 2017. This is a Hurricane Maria, and you see that the same thing happened. So the top, uh, top is, is be before, the bright spot is San Juan, and you see that, uh, uh, that uh, after the hurricane there was nothing, this a couple of days after. So we are not learning much from resilience events, or maybe sometimes they are so overwhelming that it's just hard to prepare for them. Uh, now I would like to, to switch to, to, the, to this decomposition of, of, of uh, uh, social cyber physical systems. Uh, these are complex systems, and you, you, can have, you can think of many layers, but I think that these five are, are so close to a minimum to have a, to have a quantifiable discussion. So uh, I'm talking about, about uh, flows of policy and, and legislation on top, flows of capital, information, energy, and material. Uh, so within each of these uh, flow layers, you can define uh, typical metrics. So affordability in the capital layer and, and efficiency in the energy flow layer and sustainability in the, in the material uh, flow layer. And then reliability and resilience are really coupling uh, these layers together. And I would like to uh, go to some examples showing how, how that happens. Um, so electric energy systems are multi-scale and they're hybrid. Uh, in time, we're talking about 10 orders of magnitude because in power electronics, for example, control people worry about things like uh, tens of nanoseconds in, 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 uh, in dealing with the precise switching times all the way to uh, to weeks uh, or sometimes even longer if you, if you have to plan, uh, say, a cascade of hydroelectric plants, sometimes years. So they're, they're probably more than 10 orders of magnitude. In space, we're talking seven orders of magnitude from, because you can think of a power system being something the size of, of this desk or this room to spanning a continent. And in power, you know, you're talking at least from, say, my, <laughs> so from milliwatts to uh, tens of gigawatts. So another 10 orders of magnitude. So this is a huge space, if you think. So it has many corners and many, uh, they're, they're, quite, they're not the same uh, and one has to study them in detail, but I would like to suggest that there, there are lots of commonality there. And so I, I, I would like to uh, talk about those typical cases. Uh, again, we have to talk about uh, normal and faulted operation and faults can come from nature or now unfortunately also from active adversaries. Uh, the system really has uncertain input and it's actually regularized by physics. So it's predictable because physics taking care of uh, kind of uh, so, some of the, these inputs, think of them as uh, stochastic processes. Uh, and the interesting thing about the electric energy systems is they have sparse sensing uh, and intelligence or computational power, and actually most of it is at the periphery. Uh, so it has implications on how we can and should uh, control them. So uh, if you allow me now to, to kind of simplify and, and replicate this Sankey diagram, uh, just in two layers, uh, energy on, on top and information layer on, here on the bottom. Uh, we can talk about primary conversion, about the network, about end user, uh, and control, which today typically uses measurements in, in the network and, and actuates the primary conversion. That's the uh, control loop. I'm not thinking of a, of a centralized control, of course, it's just a conceptual. There is a layer of controllers, which many of them are distributed. Now, what are the, the issues now? Well, the input, the, what's you know, here is W, is too large, and little of it comes from renewables. The system is actually unable to integrate novel components, and we can talk about this uh, a bit later. It has non-functional markets, and it's over-designed for two reasons, uh, at least. Uh, one is the, the variation of the output, uh, it's called Z. Uh, it's simply, you know, our load, load there is at least one to two, sometimes more, and, and the, all components have to be designed for the peak load. Uh, but there is another reason, and it has to do with fault accommodation. Much of the fault accommodation today is done in hardware based on, on local simple measurements. For example, current has to go 10 times the rated current for some, some, uh, some breaker to be triggered to pull out. But if the, if, the, if the current is 10 times, that means that forces are also 10 times, or maybe more, depending on. So, so we're talking about huge forces, and that's why substations are so big. Right? So there are people say that if Tesla or, or or Edison were to, to come back, they would be amazed by many things, but they would, they would recognize substations right away uh, because the, 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 the spatial, the size didn't, didn't change much. Uh, so, so why do we need more electricity? Uh, so I, I'm going back to, to this busy diagram now. I want to uh, point out some numbers. Uh, you see that, uh, uh, that the overall electrical output right now, the top right, uh, uh, I hope you can see the, the square on top uh, on, on the electricity generation, it's roughly 12 point something, 
developing or change. If we were to, to include uh, industries uh, that you can see on the third uh, pink box, uh, their output is roughly the same. Uh, I know that some, some efficiencies can be improved, but that's the kind of the same order of magnitude. If industries, big industries think cement, uh, petrochemicals, uh, uh, iron and steel, if they were to be electrified, that would be the, the, the total of their energy consumption is roughly the same of, of the total of electricity produced today. If we look into transportation, of course, electric cars are more efficient, uh, than, but you, you see the, uh, the, the current in input there, uh, which is on the say of, of order of 30 something, uh, say that we can double the efficiency, which is somewhat optimistic by, by you know, going to electric vehicles, uh, we, would still, uh, we would still get a half <laughs> of that at the output, which is another or, or 12 or 13, which means that if we were to co fully cover in industry, and, uh, and transportation, we, we would need to add two, twice as much as we have now. So this is obviously a major effort. Uh, and I would like to uh, point out these ideas of electrification uh, are, are with us, but they're, they're not all that new. Uh, this is actually the exactly 100th anniversary of a speech that Vladimir Lenin gave uh, to the Moscow Soviet uh, when he said that, that in his mind, the, the, the communism equals electrification plus power to the Soviets. Like someone who grew up in Eastern Europe, I'm glad that the first and last thing didn't come out to be true. Uh, but uh, uh, he did have a point that electrification was a major uh, ch change in Russia and elsewhere. Uh, and uh, uh, so if we think about technical progress the way we, we have it now, in what impinges of the electric industry, we are talking about renewable generation, about storage, about electrification of, uh, of major industries and transportation. So these three all, of course, drive decarbonization, assuming that energy sources are, are renewable and not, uh, not, not uh, better than current. And altogether, they can uh, hopefully stop the climate change. So this is a game that we are playing. Uh, we can even paraphrase that sustainability really equals decarbonization plus electrification. Uh, so so, so some, some of these ideas are, are, have been with us for a while, but now I think they're ripe for reevaluation. Uh, so how, would, how should we uh, integrate uh, uh, renewables? I think one... One idea is that we have to kind of switch to more to the source following, uh, meaning that we should organize uh, processes that, that, that can be controlled and scheduled so that they follow the availability of energy rather uh, than, than, than kind of uh, massaging and controlling uh, the sources to follow arbitrary uh, or very quite unpredictable loads. So how do we achieve such coordination? Well, one is that uh, we need to operate systems over larger spatial areas. And that's where electric networks come into. And they allow you essentially, if you have a bunch of uh, stochastic processes, you will get something that's more predictable if you integrate, right? If, if you integrate literally you know, as, as a mathematical operation, or if you integrate in engineering sense by, by having electric network uh, on top of them. Uh, so for a long time, uh, the uh, future energy systems will be hybrids because they will have some conventional sources because big hydro and possibly big nuclear units will be with us for a long time. And there is no reason to touch them, especially while we are short uh, in overall energy. So, so, th so the, the systems will be hybrids between these uh, electromechanical and electronic sources. And how do we achieve flexibility uh, in operating them kind of on a second by second basis? Well, better forecast, dispatchable loads, buy-sell algorithms, which try to smoothen, uh, and storage. So these are all the tools that we have at our disposal. Uh, it also may, uh, may be interesting to, uh, to integrate uh, into larger structure. So first, integration between transmission and distribution, you may think, oh, that's, that, that's nothing to it. Isn't that the same thing? Well, it should be, but it's not. Uh, because within the field of electric power systems, the distribution and transmission are often two worlds which don't talk. So now that's changing, of course, but it has to, uh, that, that transition has to, to be completed. Uh, there could be multiple energy carriers, like, uh, for example, uh, hydrogen, or uh, in, in some tra tra transition period, adding hydrogen to, uh, to nat natural gas, uh, getting what's called uh, hydrogen-enhanced natural gas, or HANG, uh, and energy hubs, which are ideas that, that you could coordinate uh, different uh, forms of storage, think uh, electricity, uh, maybe gas, uh, certainly district heat, and coordinate them, no, not, not in, a, in a building, but coordinate them in, 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 a, in a control sense, in, a, in, a, in software, if you wish. So, uh, so how would that uh, change uh, future electric energy systems? Well, uh, one is that, I think we should develop the, uh, the information layer more. Uh, and you see some additional uh, single line traces on, on, on the bottom. Uh, so 
uh, there should be more sensing, of course, coordinated control, uh, control that is typically uh, uh, distributed, so it has local component and some global information that provides context. Uh, we need better blocks. So, so yes, improving efficiency of nature of blocks is very much needed. And uh, uh, so we hope that more, more of the input will come from renewables. Um, uh, given the, the complexities of control that we have now, now probably it, it's, we should uh, decouple the system. And the cup, decoupling and having fewer layers to code at any given time can come from two sides. You see, from, from the top layer, it could come from, for example, high voltage uh, DC transmission networks to, uh, to, to, for example, to couple east and west of our country, which are now two electrical islands. But from the bottom, it's through ideas like microgrids. Uh, because you, you, you have buildings that, that, that can be controlled, uh, especially if they have storage, they can behave in interesting ways. So these two, can, I think, would allow us to control this larger system by not having to juggle too many layers at the same time. And also we need better design uh, while steering component development. What I mean is this. Uh, you, every, all of us have phones like this, right? Good thing about these uh, things from, from a design standpoint is that every couple of years, I guess three years, if you have teenagers like I do, that's less than three, they are changed, right? There's a new phone. And that means the old phone goes away. And the new phone uh, has components of many types. If you're an electrical engineer like myself, you would think it's a pretty complicated device. It has uh, analog electronics, it has digital electronics, uh, lots of uh, some, uh, some high frequency because of, of radio. So th these are distinct parts of electrical engineering. Uh, so they all, all integrate. But lessons learned in one generation are fully passed into the next. On the other hand, think about this, this room. If this room were to, to, to be renovated, many things would, would change, right? Chairs, uh, or projection equipment, maybe, maybe even a, a, a AC system. But chances that wires will actually be changed are very slim. Right. So wires that are now in these walls will stay there for a long time. Uh, so th that, that translates to larger systems. So, part of, so when we are designing a new system, we have to have in mind that there will be many changes coming, including technologies which can, we can barely predict. Uh, so that makes for, for a challenging design. Uh, so by the way, in, in, this, in, in this logic, uh, the idea of smart grid uh, is really th these, these two arrows that you see uh, kind of in purple, right? Because they, we, we are adding the end users and, and we are adding control to, 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 to an end, end users. So that, that is what smart grid is in these, in these coordinates. Of course, in addition to, to storage, which I added on top. Uh, so uh, in terms of uh, where are we now in terms of our ability to control systems, I'm, I'm showing you this diagram, which is of course notional, but think of it as being uh, in a log scale. Uh, so vertically, you, you have spa increasing spatial uh, uh, dimension. So from device to substation to region or utility, think our, our pg and &E, balancing authority like ISO, uh, California ISO, wide area, which is a couple of ISOs that together deal with reliability, and then continent-wide networks. Uh, largest in our country is Eastern Interconnection, but Western Interconnection is also quite, quite big. On the horizontal axis, I have time, but in a kind of in, in the opposite. So, so the shortest time and to the right. So from day, hour, minute, second to the cycle, electrical cycle, 60 hertz cycle, I think, 60 milliseconds. And, and this line is roughly uh, the front where uh, this is where our ability is to control these systems. The, the, the green dot that you see in the middle, AGC is automatic generation control. That's a control of frequency. Uh, that's a distri fully distributed control. Uh, and it's been around for 70 years. Uh, and that's the first industrial distributed, fully distributed controller, uh, and it's been incredibly successful. Uh, and, uh, but you see it, it controls frequency roughly with, with, with a, uh, with a uh, minute or, or, or sub-minute uh, uh, time scale at best. It works very well. The frequency is typically kept a few millihertz around 60 hertz, right? so this is, this is really dead on. Uh, so, but of course, our interest is to move this technology front to the right, to the right corner so, so that we can control uh, larger areas and faster, but uh, it, is, it, is a, it is a challenging uh, ask. So I think that the way forward would be what, what I would call uh, uh, heterogeneous infrastructure of ELSI. Uh, because uh, you see the, the electricity can be produced with many technologies. Uh, and the, and the, so, but what we can learn from our colleagues who do VLSI uh, is the, 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 the planned repeated use of, of carefully designed structures. Uh, because the way uh, our colleagues uh, figured out how to put billion things on, on, on a chip or more uh, is by carefully repeating the same structure. Uh, and we, should, we can learn from them because if we are to move from electromechanical sources, which are, there may be 2,000 large generators in North America today, uh, to millions that you would have if you have uh, renewables con connected to inverters, we have to find ways to scale 
system while maintaining things like stability. Um, so drivers for, 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 for this development are, are sustainability and cost. Enablers uh, are power electronics, sensors, cyber networks. Uh, and again, source following the, 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 the new ethos, which I think will be needed, comes from markets and forecasts on, 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 the, on the slower time scale, and then from network and storage in the fast time scale, because you need to achieve it uh, really second by second or less. And monitoring has to be include both reliability and resilience. Fault accommodation, uh, I think, should move more to software and be faster. It's a very tricky proposition, by the way, because protection is what keeps many places from burning, right? Because electrical arcs tend to be very bad in terms of, uh, in, th in terms of fire danger, so they have to be controlled very precisely. Uh, so protection is a very, very important part of, of electric energy systems. So if you change it, you're, 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 you're also ki kind of asking for, for lots of responsibility. And, uh, but I still think that if we can make systems faster, we can make them uh, smaller and simply have a better, better spatial uh, utilization. Uh, and then uh, modeling and comprehension, you see there, there's a long, the long tradition in, in this field and, and several nearby fields are using physics and chemistry and our basic understanding of uh, such processes to control systems, and there's nothing wrong with this. But I think it's time to append it in, in places, and I will mention some, uh, with what can be extracted from data. Uh, so so I, I think the two can play together quite nice. Uh, I mean, there is a hope on the horizon. Uh, so the, he, there is a, a, a plot I, I borrowed from Environmental Defense Fund. Uh, so vertically, you have gigatons of, uh, of CO2. Uh, and and, on, the, and on, the, on the horizontal, you have prices per, per ton, per ton of, of, car, of CO2. And you see, as prices go, go up, of course, the more uh, there will be motivation to remove uh, more uh, CO2 uh, out of the uh, out of the, of the atmosphere or not to generate it. But the, on the right, you see some of the interesting technologies starting with onshore wind uh, and, and then, uh, and then not, not far down is offshore wind, which is what I would like to talk about next. So this is first of my two vignettes that I would like to wrap up today. Uh, so this is a work I, I've done with, uh, with colleagues at Tufts uh, about planning uh, for offshore network uh, near, uh, near uh, eastern seaboard. Uh, here you see on the left, of course, uh, uh, eastern seaboard. On the right, in the same scale, uh, you see uh, North Sea, essentially, Northern Europe. You see Britain on the left, uh, Belgium, Netherlands, uh, uh, Germany, and Denmark on, on the right, and, and, and uh, Norway on, on, on top, actually Sweden on top. Uh, uh, so this is in the same scale. Uh, so you see many big offshore farms in the no North Sea are, are these yellow areas, which, which are, and you see that the simply Topography is different. Uh, these uh, areas can be, uh, can be reached from many directions, and they are. They're actually even building artificial islands to, to achieve so. so. So that means that these sources can have multiple uh, feed-in and feed-out uh, 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 connections, and that's very good for reliability, of course. On, in our case, that's not quite possible because the, 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 the coast is almost linear. Uh, and, uh, but it will be very important in our uh, thinking to actually connect those sources as well rather than, than just having, a, having a, a separate connection from each source. Uh, why would that be? Uh, first, these are massive uh, infrastructures. Uh, if you talk about, so th these are, uh, uh, these are uh, large uh, wind, windmill, uh, wind units. Uh, uh, the, 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 the largest one on, that's on the right, which is actually not the largest today, it's 12 megawatts, there are 18 megawatts also. But this is the height of the you know, Transamerica building in, in, in San Francisco, or uh, or, or, or in, in this case, uh, in Boston, the, the tallest building, uh, Hancock Tower. So these are very, very large units. Uh, and uh, so uh, in our case here in California, they would probably have to be floating. So that, that means that that's another layer of, of, of complexity. Here are several solutions. Uh, by the way, the, the, the oldest uh, offshore floating wind farm is five years old now, so this is not very new. But there, there is still there, there are things to be learned. Uh, but this can also actually solve one other uh, issue, which which uh, may, which is here in the background. So here is a, a, propos a proposal, one of several, for building a national macro grid, a grid that will connect our country coast to coast. Uh, and, and many of these horizontal links, especially are there, or would be fairly uh, fairly straightforward to build. But on both coasts, it's very hard. So actually, in the east coast, we, we think uh, actually is this offshore connection could be uh, the, the, the part of, of this national macrogrid. And I think, hope, uh, assuming that there is a similar development on, on our west coast, we could go for the same. Of course, there is a mighty Pacific intertide that goes north-south that, that's a ba backbone of the Western Electric Energy Network. But adding another one offshore could actually be useful. Uh, 
So now I would like to, uh, to talk about my second vignette. And this is a joint work with my friend and colleague Mark Transform at uh, Brigham Young. Uh, so uh, here is the standard form of, of dynamical models in uh, electric energy networks. So you see these differential algebraic uh, models. Uh, X are differential states, Z are algebraic states, U are controls, and P are parameters. Uh, the algebraic uh, parts of the model essentially come from a uh, multi-scale feature. These are singularly perturbed uh, uh, models of, of very short time scale, so they are approximated as, uh, with uh, algebraic equations. And there are measurements, which also happen to often happen to be nonlinear in general. So, uh, if we have a model, how would we uh, evaluate that this model is good? Well, we, we, we would hopefully uh, get some data or, or, or some simulations that we trust, and then we tweak P, we tweak parameters to get uh, these to match. Uh, but uh, uh, th th it's not a simple problem because the question is what model should be tweaked? In other words, if for a given model, that we have sh do we have a chance? Of, the problem with optimization, of course, is that often you get a result. Uh, but how, how trustworthy is that result? That, that is the, the problem here. Uh, so local methods for solving this involve uh, Jacobian, which is derivative of the measurements with respect to parameters, a matrix of the such derivatives, or uh, Fisher information matrix or Hessian uh, which is often approximated as, as uh, this Jacobian transform time itself for, for small deviations. Uh, so, so these, by uh, doing uh, matrix trickery, we can get the local information about how well behaved uh, this fitting problem is. Uh, the, the interesting uh, piece that, uh, uh, that comes from, I think, from this work, uh, which is uh, uh, largely influenced by physics literature, uh, is that there is a concept of sloppiness which is the, in technical sense, uh, which says that there is a class of models in which there is a large parameter uncertainty. Namely, uh, we think of a model with many parameters, a mapping from parameter space into a data space. Or, or imagine, but uh, this, ma this uh, mapping could be highly anisotropic. Namely, name, think about on the left here, on the one you see there, a, a ball in parameter space, or, uh, and then it gets ma mapped into something quite quite squished and elongated uh, in the behavior space. So there are directions in which small, uh, small changes in, uh, in, in parameters correspond to, to, to large changes in, in, in behavior. These are the so-called stiff directions. But then there are other so-called sloppy directions in which uh, you don't see much uh, response at all. Uh, and then uh, the idea is to, to, it turns out that if you think now that all parameters are, say, limited to be between 0 and infinity, uh, so that, uh, and then you, you, you think of what, what are the all possible uh, uh, models in, in this, uh, in this uh, data space, it turns out that often these are bounded manifolds. They are nonlinear. They could be quite ugly, but they are bounded. Uh, and then, uh, actually, uh, if we, uh, and this is magic of, of my, my uh, friend Mark, uh, that he can calculate geodesics in high dimensions, geodesics being, of course, counterparts of straight lines in curved spaces. So if you, if you can calculate geodesics on higher uh, manifolds, you can try to uh, kind of sniff out, to look for corners. Uh, and that, that's, that's justified by noticing that in many uh, systems, not, not just in the electric energy network, but elsewhere, uh, you have these, uh, uh, these manifolds that look like ribbons. Uh, they are quite wide in some directions, but very thin in others. So then, uh, if we don't know, have uh, other additional information uh, in terms of what are good models to try to identify would be those that are kind of, that are not too thin in any direction. So, so we would like to use this, this method to reduce the models to something that we have a good chance of identifying, and then do that identification. Uh, so we've tried this idea. So again, the idea is that you have some, of course, in plane, you can't go far down, uh, because you're going one dimension down at, at each corner. So from initial parameters, we have, say, two. Then you, you, in the first iteration, you go down to one. And now you're on this top green line. And then you repeat the model reduction procedure. Then you, in the second iteration, you get to this point, And then you're done if you're starting from two. But in, in, in higher dimensional models, you can, you can go further down. Uh, so here's an example from, uh, dynamics, from dynamics of power systems. Uh, so these are measurements of, of on a generator unit. Uh, here you see, uh, so, so here you see the, the calculated the manifold, and you see this transition, the geodesics that actually hits this, this, this dark blue line, which is the edge of the manifold. And this is, uh, this is the model reduction here. Uh, in terms of what it is, uh, so here you see, see what, what's, what's happening. This is a small enough system that you can, you can track it. On top is, is the calculation of the geodesics. You, you, you see the length of the arc, arc length tau, which parameterizes the, the geodesic. 
Uh, on, the, on, the, on the middle trace, you see that there are two parameters. These are two time constants. So th th this is a standard model of synchronous generators. Uh, and, and this re so what happens is one of them, in this case, it's surprising to, to the people in the field, but not that the q-axis, which is one that's typically kept, is one that, that, that's actually that, that gets reduced or evaporated. That the other uh, axis, th these are the two axis theory synchronous machines, so a standard uh, tool to understand behavior of very large electromechanical sources. So in this case, da uh, data and simulations are kind of telling us that you should do this reduction. It's a, or you can think, well, this is just a variant of a single perturbation. It's good to know, but not, not uh, I, I mean, it's, in a sense, it's reassuring because that was observed before. But there are other cases in which things are less, uh, uh, less obvious. So this is a case of what's called doubly fed induction generator. This is a, a kind of a not very modern, but very, very widespread technology in wind generators. Uh, I, I mentioned already that behavior of these units is, is uh, largely determined by controls. So there are two, uh, so th this is the two parameters that we are playing here. We, here are, are essentially scale, scaled integral and proportional uh, gain of that controller. Uh, and, and so, so, so this is in parameter space, and, and you, you see the, uh, so the, the, these are criterion values are, are, the, are, are the colors. Uh, the, the, the thick lines are geodesics mapped into, into, into uh, parameter space. Uh, and the green dots are essentially uh, Monte Carlo uh, simulations, but, but uh, with, with procedure that kind of uh, tells us to sample more often. And so, so it's just a, a tweaked. Uh, Monte Carlo, so just to see that th this picture is, is somewhat realistic. So you see here, w if you minimize, you, you actually get the value that you see here, the, the origin. But you see that there are two problems here. That if data is of the, or, or, or is not a, of, a, of a lower resolution, uh, there, th this ridge that looks kind of, kind of like an L, uh, L thing going this way, we can, it can escape either way, right? So we can either get uh, one, of the, one of those, we can get, get the, the horizontal gain to go to, go to zero, right? Or log of it to go to zero go, going left, or the other gain could, could, could escape going down. So that, that suggests that this is a tricky model to, uh, to identify. It, it's a standard model, but um, if you don't have, uh, if you don't have uh, very high quality data, uh, it, it is not, uh, not clear that you will do well. Okay, so uh, l let me wrap up with, with some comments about the, uh, how can we uh, integrate or, or, or connect such models with a data-driven model? So we, we've done some work on it, uh, on symbolic regression with physics-informed dictionaries, universal data-derived calibration. It's a joint work with Yanis Kibrikidis at, uh, at Hopkins. Uh, and uh, uh, so the, s some of, of, of our results in this suggest that you should, one should interlace physics uh, and, uh, and uh, in this case, uh, uh, deep networks uh, in kind of tapestry-like uh, like fashion. Uh, because there are pieces for which you have very, very good physical knowledge. And it makes no sense to throw it away. But there are pieces in which uh, you, you know much less. I mean, think about in the case of synchronous generators, there's actually a beautiful theory of almost 100 years of applying, uh, starting from Maxwell equations. Uh, and then massaging them in interesting ways and coming up with, 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 with good models that have withstood the test of time over, over, over decades. On the other hand, when we, when we model uh, loads, like our campus or, 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 or Palo Alto, we, we start with some basic statistical, well, how many loads there are, and, so, and, and then we add them, average them. So, so clearly, th this is a much cruder uh, approach. And, and it makes sense to balance it by if, if we don't have a uh, fundamental science understanding of it, we might as well uh, see what data is telling us and use that. All right. Uh, so, on my last slide, uh, I would like to say that uh, societal expectations from electric energy networks are there will be carbon free electricity, there will be efficient, reliable, and resilient networks, and there will be functional markets in, in public policy. We, we know that there, there were exceptions to this. Uh, you see, the key driver. Uh, for, for this uh, uh, transition in sustainability. We're doing this because of, of unacceptable impact that electric energy systems have on, on environment. Uh, the key enablers, uh, I think, are in the information flow, because that's, where, that's the technology that, that's uh, evolving the fastest, uh, and it can certainly make a difference. Uh, but you see, trajectory will be driven uh, by material and capital flow layers, because can we find materials to, to build what needs to be built, and uh, can there be enough uh, support in terms of money to actually do that. With this, I will thank you. Uh, I will stop here and ask you for questions. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Alex. That was a, 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 
kind of fire hydrant uh, flow of provocative ideas. I think it's going to take me a, a few weeks to catch up to where you, oh, you were with that. I would say, just as an overall comment, uh, so you could conclude that the biggest invention of this century might be a variant of the biggest invention of the last century. Now, I, uh, as someone who is that field, I would, I would say yes, but there is lots to go in this century, so we shall see. <laughs> yeah, 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 good point. Uh, so uh, we have time for a couple of general audience questions before we move into the student session. Do we have any questions from the audience? Big picture, small picture, big devices, a little or? So what do you think the prospects? Can you use the what do you think the, what do you think the prospects are for a nationally interconnected grid? Uh, it, uh, that, that seems like hard to me. It, it is hard, uh, and I, I think there has to be a good motivation for it. Uh, I've heard the, the, the stories from, from, my, uh, from colleagues who were there uh, that there, was a, there were attempts to do it in the past. Uh, and I think the, 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 the famous example that I, I heard about from many people is that they tried to interconnect it. Uh, and there is a four corners area in New York. There's only one place in, in the map when there are four corners, four states in need. And there is a nearby large uh, installation. And so there, were, there was a unit there uh, which unfortunately interacted dynamically with, with the unit in New York. So this is very far. Uh, and, and interacted in a sense that some very large uh, things got twisted that shouldn't be twisted. Uh, so a decision was made, this shall not be done ever, and we are done. Uh, but I, I think that, that may change, especially in motivations. I think if, uh, for example, if uh, there is a, a large and a continued large development on onshore wind, say in Dakotas, and then it will make sense to try to connect this with our side with the West Coast. So that will be one, one motivation. I, I think that, uh, that it should be done. And it, uh, so there has to be economic reason for it. But I think it should be encouraged by other means because I, I think that the large networks are eminently feasible. I mean, all of Europe is essentially one network. Uh, uh, network in China is bigger than any of, of our... So, so there are technical means to, to operate large networks. And uh, uh, so, but it does, of course, the, the, to have a large network, you have to build it. And, and that requires, of course, building or that. And still, uh, the, the, the timeline of getting permits for a transmission line, I think, is in decades, right? That's the unit. Uh, so so that, that is long time. And, and in, especially in current climate of very large economic expectations on, on, on short time frames, uh, that, that would be hard. Any other audience questions at this point? I know we're running a little bit late. Uh, actually, another uh, that I, uh, question I think I'd ask, kind of, kind of like Lynn's, but in, in a little bit the other direction. So whose job is this anyway? Uh, obviously, you were recommended to us by the Bits and Watts folks here. Uh, you're at Slack. So is that one way to get started, to have the teams around this area get together to see if at least you could scale things up to that degree? Or are you already working on a bigger plan that might involve people on the East Coast or Europe, Eastern Europe? Or oh, I wish I wish I were working on so, it. So, I, do, you, do you have any thoughts about that general uh, question? Uh, these ideas are terrific, and you're starting to make significant, uh, measurable process. But to get to where you want to go, from the top of this to the bottom, it seems like there needs to be a bigger plan. I know this is a totally unfair question, but I ask it anyway. Right. Yeah, I, I think that there, is, there are several things that have to come together. I mean, if you think of, of uh, technology readiness levels, the, the, which is this NASA uh, produced and now widely used way of measuring different technologies, and the universities uh, are, of course, very good in do, doing the kind of fundamental research. And, 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 then, uh, and then, so say levels so one to three, uh, and then there, there is proverbial value of that uh, four, five, six, where, where technology is, is, is sort of transferred from lab demonstrations to something that, that's realistic. And then there, there are higher levels, seven, eight, nine, where, where industry and, 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 and private uh, uh, enterprise can pick up. Uh, so I think the, the, mid, the middle area, the hope is that national labs can do it. So the Slack is there to, to or for example, to cover it. So uh, Slack being such, such a 
closely integrated part of Stanford is a great idea in, in, in that regard. Of course, there has to be support for this. Uh, and I, I, I'm, I'm a beneficiary of GSAP from, from, from 10 years back, and I know that uh, this was unique because in, the, in our case, it was the GSAP support that allowed uh, a number of us to then go after one of these engineering research center uh, awards with NSF, and 10 years later, we, I think we produced something useful. Uh, we certainly have fun while doing that. But the, there has to be a, a sustained support. Uh, and I think the, uh, the, the, the span is so wide that it requires kind of all of the above. Great. On that note, uh, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with us today. And uh, good luck in the future. Let, let us know what we can do, and you do likewise. Thank you very much.